So obviously I think it's named after you. Salt. Well, actually, it's not. Gaselda here. She is a black rat snake. Right now, we are using it to house a bald eagle. Hi, everyone. My name's Emily Fibri. I'm also known as Ranger M. I'm an environmental communicator and educator, and I get to talk to a lot of different people about all things nature and conservation. I love to knowledge share, and that's what I want to do with you. So come on, let's go learn with Ranger M. Today I'm at Salt Haven Wildlife Rehabilitation and Education Centre and we're going to learn all about what they do for animals. So come on, let's go meet up with Brian. Well Brian, thanks for joining me today and I've actually heard a lot about you uh, through my own work and through my uh, you know, personal life just working in the outdoor world. Um, so I'm really happy to chat with you today and to learn more about yourself and Salt Haven and everything you guys do here. So thanks for joining. Well, you're welcome. I'm excited to be here. I was wondering to start us off if you could tell us a bit about the history of Salt Haven. So obviously I think it's named after you, Salt. Well, actually it's not. <laughs> oh, okay. Not too many people know this, you know, but in 2004 we were incorporated and of course we had to come up with a name unless we wanted just a number. And we couldn't think of anything. And uh, I was reading this book about this, um, about this l fictitious land and these ships would come into the harbor every night and they were kind of curious workmanship and in the morning they'd be all gone. And the, the gist of the story was is that these ships would cross over into other dimensions and the name of the harbor that they were in, Salt Haven. Okay. And I thought, but it's, that's perfect because, you know, the animals that come here are like they're going into another dimension to be healed, released, and free type of thing. And uh, I thought that would be a perfect name. So that's where the name came from. But it fits oh, wow. very well with yes. the family name, too. And that's what everybody thinks, right? Yeah. But, Have you always been in kind of wildlife rehab or what were you doing prior? I came from a, an entertainer background. I was a musician and uh, we had... Uh, the, the group that I worked with, we had four songs in the top 10 in the Canadian charts. We opened shows for, I don't know who you'd know, Beach Boys, oh, wow. Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons, Roy Orbison, Mamas and Papas, Ricky Nelson, John oh. Cougar Mellencamp, to name a few. Wow. And um, when you're a musician, you're a musician 24 seven. Mm -hmm. it, never, it never shuts off. You wake up in the middle of the night with an idea for a song. Well, you better get out of bed and write it down, right? And it's the same thing here. I don't get too much inspiration about writing songs anymore, but you're, you're a wildlife rehabilitator 24 seven. There's mm -hmm. always animals that need to be cared for, fluids for them in the middle of the night or medications or whatever. So it's a busy, busy job. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm accustomed to the lifestyle and I like what I do. So it's not really work, you know? So since 2004, has Salt Haven changed much? I, th I think recently you guys have grown uh, yeah. a lot right yeah we have grown a lot in 2004 we were operating out of a, what we called it a clinic but it was really a shed with an air conditioner <laughs> that's basically what it was but you know what we we did as many animals in that little shed as we do now and now we can do it better because we have a better facility and we built the the, the new clinic with tours in mind you know we had mm -hmm. the, the glass windows and that people can see in what's going on behind the glass um, but then COVID hit mm -hmm. and so and then now we have highly pathogenic avian influenza. So, you know, we're, we're, we're waiting, but one day we're gonna have, be able to have tours here and have the public come in and see what goes on behind the scenes. Oh, that would be great. Mm. I feel like a common uh, perception of certain animals like raccoons and um, maybe foxes and so on is like, if you ever see them in daylight, they're most likely sick. Yeah. Is that true? Well, it can be, but it's not always true. Right now with raccoons, and has been for the last four or five years, distemper is really the culprit here. Well, they had a problem with rabies and raccoons in the Hamilton area for the last three or four years, but it's, it's kind of quelled now and things are, are better with that. But now we're, we get probably half a dozen calls a day for raccoons with distemper. And there are some very um, distinct symptoms that are easily recognizable. One of them being out during the day, but wandering aimlessly. I mean, a normal healthy raccoon would be up the nearest tree with, if you were within 50 meters of them. But these raccoons don't seem to be bothered by it. Crusty eyes, limping, their pads on their feet get really um, hard and crusty and they don't like it. So they start self-mutilating and chewing their feet. And it's a horrible, horrible disease. And once the symptoms become neurological, mm. 
um, they're going to die. There's no coming back from it. So they should be humanely euthanized. And that darn virus can hang out in the environment for up to four months in the right conditions. And they carry both canine and feline distemper too. So cats, dogs, other raccoons, skunks. It's uh, pretty awful. Is there anything uh, we can do as community members to help prevent the spread of distemper? One of the things, I guess, is to have your pets vaccinated. Mm -hmm. If you have a dog or a cat that's vaccinated, there's no worries. But if they're not, like I say, that virus can hang around in the environment for quite a while and your dog goes sniffing around and mm -hmm. uh, you can get it too. So it's really important, especially now with that uh, distemper being as uh, prevalent as it is in the environment. If someone were to be driving down the road kind of, and they come across maybe, or, or even themselves accidentally hit an animal, could you kind of go through the process of maybe them contacting you and what they should do? Yeah, that's a, a, a very traumatic experience mm -hmm. for a lot of people, uh, especially those people that love wildlife and animals in general. Yeah, giving us a call. Most police departments, humane societies, uh, veterinarians, they, they know who Salt Haven is mm -hmm. and they have our phone number. Um, so if they give us a call, our phones are answered from 8 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. And... Uh, if we're not full mm -hmm. uh, for that particular species, uh, we can take them. And, um, but we get to that point in the summertime where we do get full. Right. There's only so much we can do. You know, you, you figure we get, on a really busy day in the summertime, we'll get as much as 150 phone calls for wow. sick, injured, orphaned, wild. You, you just can't take them all in. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do in those circumstances is put people in touch with other wildlife rehabilitators that might be able to. We have a list that we give them and they can make those phone calls and hopefully find help that way. There's obviously a, a large need for wildlife rehab based on what you're saying right now. Um, but I know your clients don't really pay you. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so how do you keep uh, your center going? Like, are you dependent on grants or donations kind of thing? Yeah, all of the above. Donations are huge. Oftentimes people that will bring us an animal will uh, leave a donation uh, and that helps us to keep things going here. Uh, we work on grants. Uh, we do a lot of grant writing. Um, we've had some estates left to us. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, people are just dying to give us money. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, um, it, all of that is important, and there's no one thing that is really a standout, but all together, it, it really does make a difference. A lot of it is, um, you know, we don't have a clue. An animal comes in, and we're not sure. We rely on veterinarian expertise, and some of that can cost money. Uh, X-rays. Gosh, like a set of x-rays, you're talking at least $150, and, uh, you know, there are follow-up visits and so on. So, yeah, it, it's it, the financial side of Salt Haven is always a concern and one that is going on in the back of our mind. Salt Haven isn't about one or two people. It's a community effort, really, is what it is. And uh, as long as it remains that way, I think we're going to do okay. Yeah, because actually you were saying just before we started filming that you depend so, um, very highly on volunteers as well. Oh, yeah. Our volunteer program is really the lifeblood of Salt Haven. Our volunteers work with their hearts as well as their hands. I mean, they're amazing. Um, we get about 90 applications uh, starting January 1st every year right through to the uh, uh, 1st of March and we'll choose maybe 25 of those people. My favorite thing is, is that one and one does not equal two when you have that symbiotic relationship going. Mm -hmm. One and one is 11, and uh, that's the power that Salt Haven is, we're 11. <laughs> that's awesome. Obviously you're a group of very compassionate um, and dedicated individuals, so I, if I were to be in your shoes, um, I don't know how I wouldn't be able to create a connection with all of the wildlife mm. that comes in. Is it hard sometimes to say, you know, goodbye when they fly or run away kind of thing? Yeah, when you have a bald eagle and you know you're the last set of hands that's ever going to handle that oh. bird likely, you know, and to see it go, you know, it was sick and probably wouldn't have survived in the wild on its own, but now it's healed and uh, released and free. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Wow, mm -hmm. you know, that's really something. And uh, yeah, the volunteers get emotionally involved. We try hard not to let that happen. Mm -hmm. For the longest time, I didn't allow our volunteers to give the animals names because you become too attached, <laughs> right. right? And um, 
but I, I gave up on that. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's going to happen anyway. Yeah. And um, our job here is to keep the wild in wildlife. If when we're done and they have become habituated or imprinted on people, we've failed. Mm -hmm. And they're going to lead a very diminutive life out in the wild. So we kind of spoke about uh, what someone could do if they hit or injure an animal kind of thing or find an, an injured animal. Um, what do you do once you get an animal, once it's brought to you or you go and pick it up? The first thing is, is getting information mm -hmm. that helps us to understand because the animal can't tell us what's wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's like a black box. And so the donor that is bringing the animal to us, we try to get as much information as we can from them so that we can kind of get a picture as to what might be wrong, mm -hmm. what kind of medication might be used, uh, what care the animal's going to need. Uh, he's going to need to be in a, a warm, uh, humid um, uh, condition perhaps. Um, he's going to need fluids to counteract um, things like shock um, and uh, medications perhaps, uh, like with head trauma hitting a window. Uh, you'd use a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory to reduce brain swelling. So all these little things help us to administer to the animal to the best of our ability, and then the rest is really up to him and Mother Nature as to which way it's going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but the food is another thing, too, because, you know, you get baby birds in, um, their dietary uh, needs change as they get bigger. Mm -hmm. So you have to be aware of that, too. It's a job. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really coordination. That's why I say our, our volunteers and trainers are the lifeblood of everything we do here. Yeah, that's amazing. How long do you think, I, I know it probably differs on the type of animal and the injury and stuff, but how long do you keep an animal normally? Or how, what's the longest you've kept an animal kind of thing, besides your ambassadors, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> well, about a year, I think, would be the longest. It really depends on the animal itself sometimes. And, um, yeah, resources. Mm -hmm. I know I hate even mentioning that, but it, it boils down to that sometimes. Yeah. Do we have the room? Do we have the medications? Um, do we have the staff to be able to, you know, make sure this animal is going to see it through to the end? Because if we're expecting him to stay here for three months, uh, what kind of life is he going to live while he here? he's here? I mean, you know, if he's going to be scared out of his wits because there's too much noise or whatever. So we have to be cognizant of all those things in order to get them back out into the wild again. First of all, we get all the information. Then they go to the triage room. And in the triage room, we give them a cage card a medication chart. We administer to their immediate needs, uh, you know, wounds, uh, fluids, uh, that kind of thing. And then they're assigned to a room. So we have a mammal room. Uh, and, and just down the hall, we have a avian room. And the avian room is where all the birds go. And uh, so we may have, and, and those birds, oh my gosh, like some of them need to be fed every 20 minutes from sun up till sundown. Yeah. So that's a huge job. So you look on the counter and you may see a, a dozen uh, of these little kitchen timers mm -hmm. and they're all going off at, you know, <laughs> saying, okay, that, that one needs medication. This one over here needs food, uh, you know. And so we have another room. It's, we call our lab room. We have two isolation rooms. So if an animal comes in and we're not sure what he's got, we don't mm -hmm. want to be infecting the whole clinic with that. So these isolation rooms have their own ventilation, their own heat, their own cooling, and uh, their own humidity. So um, you were fairly well equipped that way. Another way I actually learned a lot about you and your programming was actually you've done a TV show for Rogers as well. We <laughs> have done that. It's kind of fun to, I guess, to see how things work here from a different perspective, mm -hmm. you know, from the, through the eyes of a camera. And, uh, you know, sometimes I... Uh, I'll see something that they've shot and I think, God, I'll never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I look stupid there. <laughs> but yeah, and that's the other thing too, you know, we don't know, we just don't know everything. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much that we don't know about nature and wildlife. My gosh. But, you know, as, as stupid as I am, you learn something over 35 years, you know, <laughs> yeah. being involved. It's just, it's going to fall in your lap sooner or later. But it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to work at because there's always something new mm -hmm. and you're learning something new all the time, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, that's part of the satisfaction we get. It's like exploring new things. Hi, 
Hi, Mel. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about yourself and your role here at Salt Haven. I am the operations manager here at Salt Haven. I've been full time here for two years, but I've been a volunteer in various capacities since 2008. Wow. So yeah. you're a long hauler. Yeah, definitely. They can't get rid of me. They've tried. <laughs> Perfect. Well, you're going to tell us a bit about this building that's behind us. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly is it? So what we're standing in front of right now is called a Raptor Muse. So it is where we house our ambassador, so our educational animals who live here full time. We have four ant raptors or birds of prey living here right now. And it's also where our bird of prey patients go to live as well. We have a snowy owl. They are native here to Ontario, but they migrate down from up north and they come down here for the winter. And then we have a lagger falcon a little bit further down named Shakar. They are not native here to Ontario. They're actually from Southeast Asia. He came to us as a patient. He was being bred for falconry. Okay. And he figured out how to untie the knot that was holding him uh, onto his perch. Uh, and so he ended up coming to us as a patient because he got trapped in the tree. And he has been here for 19 years. Wow. Yeah. How long do they live? Good question. In the wild, they can live about 15 to 20 years. But in captivity, we can extend that to 20 or 25. And that's oh. because we take away that risk of predation and, you know, food is abundant. And then down in the very end, we have a bald eagle whose name is Spirit also an ambassador, and he came to us also as a patient. They are native here to Ontario. And he ran into a high tension power line and ended up having to have one wing amputated and he lost one eye. So he's not flighted, so we keep his enclosure safe for him um, and everything can he can climb or jump. Mm -hmm. on and uh, he likes to greet all of the volunteers with a nice high-pitched little call. <laughs> it's really awesome. cute. <laughs> all right Mel, who's this? So you have Gaselda here. She is a black rat snake and she's an educational ambassador here with us. You can see she is quite active mm -hmm. and uh, she loves to go for a crawl around outside. It's actually part of her daily enrichment. Oh, so wow. every day we take her, well when the weather's warm enough, we take her outside, we let her slither around. Her favorite thing to do is climb anything and everyone. These guys are native here to Ontario. Yeah. They are constrictors, so they don't eat live prey. They constrict and eat their prey um, afterwards. So there are two distinct populations here of black rat snakes. There's the Frontenac axis and the Carolinian axis, and they are threatened and endangered. Mm. And one of the biggest problems facing them is habitat loss. Yeah. So people perceive snakes as being um, malicious or not friendly, but they are actually our biggest allies in rodent control and they serve such a purpose in the in the ecosystem. One of the threats that these guys face also, instead of, other than just habitat destruction, is secondary rodenticide poisoning. So people are trying to control the rat and mouse population by putting out rat poison. The mice and rats will eat that, but they don't stay where the poison is. They wander back out outside mm -hmm. and then they're an easy target for someone like Gus Alda or a rat snake or a fox or a bird of prey to eat. And the poison actually goes up the food chain and it ends up being lethal to not just the mice and rats, but also to the uh, predators who are eating them. All right, Mel, on to the next building. Can you tell us a bit about this one? Yeah, for sure. So what we're standing in front of is called the bat bungalow <laughs> and it's been built for our bat population. We rehabilitate um, last season we did over 40 bats this season we're at about 24 and what we're going to use this for is when they get when the weather gets warm enough we can bring the bats outside and use it to condition them before releasing them so we use it to build up their muscles and you can see that the netting on the bat house is wide enough to let insects come in so what it'll do is it'll give them a natural environment to learn how to hunt because they're aerial, aerial insectivores so they'll dive through the air and chase the insects the other nice fact is that we actually had four pups, so four babies born in captivity this year, and this will allow the babies to learn how to hunt before they're released. They'll just be kind of flying around, mostly at nighttime, obviously, right? Yeah. So we're gonna add in some bat houses so that they can, what we call roost during the day, so they can go and sleep during the day. And then we're gonna put in some light sources to attract the aerial insects into the bat house. And then that way they can hunt at night when, when they're ready to come out. Tell me about this building. For sure. So this we have named the Lush Lodge because we partnered with Lush Cosmetics and through their um, charity pot program, we were able to raise the funds to build this flight pen. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So it is a 40 foot by 20 foot flight pen and we fit the inside all with various height perches. And right now we are using it to house a bald eagle who's recovering from a fractured wing. And we had to put him through a program of wing wrap 
physiotherapy and laser therapy. Okay. And then after monitoring through x-rays, we were able to get him to a point where his fracture had healed. And now he's just conditioning in the flight pen and he's building up muscle and building up endurance and also giving him time to let those feathers grow back. Well, this is a great uh, structure and awesome that you could partner with Lush and mm -hmm. kind of get it built and everything. Yeah, we're really fortunate. Yeah, so I think there's one more place to explore and I can't wait to see inside. You got it, to the <laughs> clinic. <laughs>